lot about communicating. For me, people ask me all the time, they're like, well, how do you feel about being accessible? And to me, it's not a matter of accessibility. To me, it's a matter of communicating. And for me as an artist, that's an important aspect of what I do as an artist. I, to me, it doesn't make sense not to. I actually find it a greater challenge when I'm creating something to write something that I hope will communicate than it is for me just to set out and write anything and not even think about the communication thing. I mean, I really have to ponder how I'm going to take the listener from the opening measure to the end of the piece because I hope to hold their attention the entire time. I don't think there's any way to know how to write a home run piece though. I think it's, you try to write something that's true, that's heartfelt, and I think the audience will respond. That's actually kind of, it's a, it's like working on a, a seed of faith, kind of, and hoping that the crop will come up that you're planting, but you just don't know. A lesson with George Crumb once and he said in the lesson you know he said Jennifer the most important thing in the end is how it sounds and I remember sitting in the lesson and thinking gosh if that's like the most important thing maybe I should start from that standpoint and trust that all my training will will lead me now the ironic thing is there are three or four students doing dissertations on my pieces now they're dissecting them and they're finding all kinds of things much to my surprise, I think much to their surprise, because they often come to me and say, all right, can you show me your sketches and what you've been thinking theoretically? How have you put this together? How did you construct this piece? And I usually don't have many answers for them. It's not the way they think they're gonna find my sketches, but they find all sorts of things in there. So I think a lot of it maybe happens instinctively. It's just from studying enough music and having played in an orchestra and having conducted orchestras. I think there's a body of knowledge there that has kind of accumulated over the years. And the pieces that don't work, I throw away. I mean, I, I give myself permission to fail on things and I will try um, different languages, different style pieces, different speeds that things can unfold. Um, and if it doesn't work, I throw the piece away. I don't keep it. We do actually get requests all the time for um, pieces that have been pulled from the, I probably have pulled two dozen pieces, maybe, maybe even a little more than that. One of the first pieces I, I wrote that I thought was only in my house, but it turned out other people were Xeroxing it. It was a flute choir piece that uh, has been recorded a lot. There's not anything I can do it. It is out in the world at this point. The flute players like playing it. I'm just kind of horrified by the piece. Totally horrified by it. <laughs> Every time I start a new piece, I think, I can't remember how to write. I think that every time. I, I don't remember how to do this. Even if I, like I finished the piece last week and I'm, I started a piece three days ago, and I'm sitting here staring at the blank page going, I can't remember how to do this. <laughs> it happens every single time. It's bad. The first three, four, five, or six days are awful. It's not bad. It's awful. I mean, it's, and I've been going through that for the past couple of days now, saying I can't remember how to do this, I can't, I can't come up with any ideas, this is uninteresting, I think every idea is uninteresting. I think this is going to be hideous, this is going to crash and burn, it's going to be a public crash and burn, it's going <laughs> to, oh the doubt is, is rampant and the suffering is massive and poor Cheryl has to cope with it. She calls it the technique of talking the composer off the ledge. <laughs> She says she's gonna write a book on dealing with the different stages of grief of a piece. Because there's also that point at the end where you have to actually give the piece to the group, which means you can't make any more changes. 
So it has to be wrenched out of my hand. <laughs> it has to go off to whoever's going to play it. And it is pretty agonizing. But those first couple of days are, they're just awful. They're absolutely awful. I realized everything in my life was coming down to 30 minutes. It actually was going to come down to a 30 minute intersection that if the piece bombed, that was it. There would be no more commissions. And I have been really adamant throughout my life about supporting myself on commissions. So I realized that if this went down the tubes, there'd be like no going back. I'd be like getting a job, you know, at Mickey D's. <laughs> I was having images. I thought, because, you know, your brain goes through scenarios. And I must confess, it never occurred to me it would have the success it did. That Somehow that scenario did not enter my mind. I don't know why. I think because I was too terrified. And I knew that all these people were coming to Philly when I found out this was happening. They, they were coming to see the new hall. The hall had just been open a couple of months. And they wanted to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra and Wolfgang Swallows conducting Ein Held and Leben. And they were looking at the program, justifiably so, going, who's this Jennifer Higdon? I mean, I totally understand. And they're like, oh, it's the whole first half of the program. I mean, you can almost feel the energy emanating from the experience. And, you you know, you could hear the debate. Should we stay and have dessert and coffee at our dinner and maybe go in for the second half? <laughs> and, you know, the really funny thing, some of the musicians confessed to me later that they had nicknamed my piece. They were doing Ein Hilden Leben on the second half. They'd actually nicknamed my piece Ein Higden Leben, which I... <laughs> They didn't tell me that during the week that this was going. I guess I must have looked kind of pale, like no blood in my face. I was nervous or anything. But they admitted it a couple of weeks later. I, I was at a festival with them where we were we were working with young kids, high school kids and youth orchestras. And I was down there working with young composers. And they said, you know, we nicknamed your piece the Ein Higden Leben. And I was like, really? I said, is that an insult or not? And then I realized it was actually the ultimate compliment. It was the ultimate compliment. So couldn't get better than that, man. <laughs> My brother and I went to this thing, it was at the High Museum of Art, it was in the auditorium there in Atlanta. And this artist had strapped himself to a black canvas and he was dressed all in black. And his plan was to put glue all over the front of the canvas and his clothes. And the idea was to turn on a fan down the aisle in the auditorium and put white feathers in and have the white feathers blow on the artist who was attached to the canvas. And he thought that, well, he will just appear out of the darkness, suddenly there would be white feathers there. But he didn't think about the fact that if you use something like rubber cement, which you would have to use to be sticky enough to catch the feathers, that that stuff affects you immediately. It can make you high instantaneously. And so he gets out there on the stage. He, they just put the rubber cement on him. He was standing there maybe two or three seconds, and then suddenly he just passed out. He, now he was strapped to the canvas, so he went over completely backwards <laughs> on the stage and collapsed. And it was quiet for a moment, and I heard some guy behind us say, is that guy all right up there? <laughs> my brother and I looked at each other. I think I was about six years old. My brother was four, or I was seven, and he was five. We looked at each other, and I remember thinking, oh, what are these adults doing? This is what they call art. I actually thought that at a young age. I might have actually gotten all the need for heavy experimenting out of my system by the time I was nine from attending so many things like this. But I often think about that guy strapped to the canvas and how he didn't think through, <laughs> he didn't think through the process very well, hadn't planned it out. So you see things like that happen in performances and I think, hmm, I don't want to repeat that mistake. So maybe I have to figure out a way around. But it's an interesting thing for a kid to see. My initial foray into self-publishing came about out of necessity. People wanted the music, 
but the only way to get it to them was for me to give it to them, for me to either Xerox it or print it up. But the nice part is, you know, we get situations where there's a junior high somewhere, they don't have any money, but they really want a piece. We'll send it to them. Well, I mean, there, I don't see any reason not to. If there's a way to kind of enable spreading of music, why not? You know, this, we're all supposed to be in the same boat rowing together. That's the most important thing. But this also allows me to make changes in the pieces, or sometimes we adapt pieces for a particular group, but they have a different instrumentation. I can sit down and do that because I have the copyright. It's it's still my piece. So no, I make my living from commissions and publishing. It's definitely my teaching is like a negligible a negligible amount. It is from the commission, and I've been able to do that since 1994. So. What is that, 13 years? What year are we in? <laughs> <laughs> so it is totally doable. It helps, I think it helps other people too, that's the thing. Because other composers can go, oh, well, if she can do it, maybe I can do it. So I often will talk to them about that when I go to universities, you know, what you got to do, how do you get this set up. So it's, it's, a, it's a different ploy though, isn't it? It's not, it's not the way the music model has worked up till now, but with computers and staples and Office Max. Heck, why not? <laughs>